So last part of verse 3. This is still interesting. It says, and her smoke rose up forever and ever, right? Now, wait a minute. Her smoke rose up forever and ever. Compare that with Revelation 14. Revelation 14, verse 8. Revelation 14, verse 8. What's going on? Remember that interesting theory I pulled out? That Babylon would be like Sodom and Gomorrah sinking down to hell? So it might be more true than you think because the fire that's burning her is not just regular fire. It's going to be hell fire. All right, look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. And there followed another angel saying what? Babylon is fallen, is fallen. See, it's at that timeline. Now look at the next part, verse 11. And the smoke of their what? Torment ascendeth up forever and ever. See, that's hell fire. Okay, return to Revelation 18. So there's no doubt, Babylon then, it would sink down to hell then. It really seems like Babylon is sinking down to hell. So what becomes originally a theory, it seems to be more of a fact now, it looks like. All right, now uh, let's see how much uh, verses we can stretch, all right? Let's see how much verses we can stretch here. Uh, verse 5, uh, verse 4. The four and twenty elders, so remember the twenty-four elders? Those are Christian saints of all time. And the four beasts, remember those four cherubims up in heaven? Fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. So I guess we just don't learn when to shut up. So we just, let's do it again, you know. And then we fall down and worship God who's sitting on the throne. And we say, amen, praise ye Jehovah. So I don't know who's going to be that numbskull at verse 4 that keeps saying, amen, amen, and amen, and won't <laughs> shut up, you know. But you can thank that person that it's, uh, you can thank that person for verse 4, okay. You can thank that person who's just going to keep doing that at verse 4, all right. That person didn't exist, perhaps verse four, verse 4 would not exist. Who knows? Amen. There we go, right? We found one. We found one right here. We found one right here. <laughs> Amen. Amen, brother. All right, verse 5, and a voice came out of the throne. So there's a voice that comes out of God's throne now, saying, praise our God. Now look at this. This God right here, uh, he, he, uh, like some of the atheists said, said this guy is, uh, this God is so full of himself. Such a narcissist. You know, this guy just wants to be complimented every single time. Well, the thing is this, is that if you knew, if you only know, dear atheist sir, my poor atheist friend, if you only knew how much that kind of a God did so much for me, yeah. he deserved 10,000 yeah. praises, if not even all of eternity. Amen. Because he saved my eternity yeah. with his very own life and gave up his most prized possession, his holiness. Worthy. Amen. So he should be worthy. So then it says, saying, praise our God, all ye his servants. So now it's like after they sing the hymn for probably five hours, and then out of the throne, they said, do it again. Praise our God, all ye his servants. They're like, oh, so then I guess we'll have to, uh, so then I'll, I'll probably run around the galaxy three more times after that, you know. <laughs> Glory to God. Praise our God. Amen. Amen. And ye that fear him, both small and great. So whether you're a small guy or a big guy, in other words, whether you have, uh, no, not height, brother, okay? So don't get full of yourself. So both small and great. In other words, like uh, little in reputation, you don't have that much, or you're a great reputation, or big mass or little mass, it doesn't matter. The point is both small and great, whether you're uh, less famous or more famous, the point is that whether small and great, everyone fears God. So throughout all time, Christianity has, held, has had small people that the Lord used and great people that the Lord used. So these people, they fear God. And that's why he deserves worship. So that should be something. You know why you should sing a hymn? Not only because you're happy, because you fear him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Do, you know, uh, the blowout, we can sing songs like, uh, you know, thank God that he saved my soul from hell. But the ones that really get us going is when we sing all hail Emmanuel why because we fear that God all nations will bow before him when we sing holy holy you know said austere atmosphere at the blowout when we sing holy holy gives you chills because we fear him Amen. all right I want to close it with uh, verse 6 really well 
uh, what time is it? Uh, maybe I can squeeze verse 7 real quickly. Okay, so let's, let's do verse 6. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude. So obviously a huge number of people, all their voices together. And as the voice of many waters, now look at this, the voice of many waters and the voice of mighty thunderings saying, Alleluia. So when, all, when they're all saying with one voice, praise ye Jehovah, which is Alleluia, that voice is what? The voice of waters and thunders. Now this is something interesting over here. Because if we are to go backwards over here, so let's say that if we go backwards, so let's say pre, right, tribulation. When we go backwards, we hear the voice out of heaven, do we not? Yeah. We hear a voice out of heaven that says, come up hither. And throughout the book of Revelation, the vo you'll notice that phrase, the voice of many waters and thunders, right? Now, what is going on over here? This is what I think what's going on over here is that because of that sea of glass all the way over here, what's dividing it is what? That those waters, sea of glass, right? Yeah. And then God's voice, uh, when he comes down out of heaven for the second advent, it comes down. The only thing that can pierce through that is thunder. So his voice like thunder. So you know what I think? I think it's this, is that um, you'll notice it's not just God, but it's voices out of heaven. Yeah. So you know what's going to happen? You know what our voice is going to sound like? Because of that sea of glass over there, and the only scientific natural way that can go through that is that electric, uh, is that uh, thunder, is that lightning that can pierce through, or some form of sound wave or electricity that can just go through where the Lord does some kind of supernatural or scientific natural means that will pierce through that absolute zero, boom, like that, at a moment like that, where it's like light and lightning, see, which is uh, known as the fastest element for the, uh, for the scientific principles. But those things, it's something that can do something like that, that can uh, call, that can transmit the sound to the earth or it can cause us to rapture up to heaven. Now imagine you're going to have that kind of voice, Amen. that kind of power. That's going to be something. You think that the UN has a chance then against us? Absolute zero chance. When all you have to do is just look at one of them and say hi, and as soon as you say hi, they blow up in blood at the second advent. You know why? Because uh, that's how, when God gives you his glorified body, just the sight of looking at God, you what? You drop dead. Thank you, Lord. How about that, man? That's powerful. What a scene over there. Uh, ver the last part of verse 6, don't you like that? And isn't that a familiar song? For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Why? Our Lord God, omnipotent means all power. All powerful, he reigns. Handel, when he wrote that song, that song is actually supposed to be for the tribulation. It's not for today, it's for the tribulation. So the reason why I like the hallelujah chorus is, you know why, I'm, you know why it's hallelujah, hallelujah? It's not what a lot of people think. Can you imagine these atheists and unbelievers at San Francisco standing up at the Hallelujah Chorus? Do they realize what they're standing up to? They're standing up to at the Hallelujah of fearing God and seeing the Roman system burn to the ground. They have no idea what they're praising God about. When that person stands up, can, can you imagine you say to the liberal, oh, so you're praising God that the Pope's church is going to burn to the ground? What? <laughs> Imagine starting out your witnessing like that. They'll be in shock mode, right? And probably your witnessing might not really get through after that. <laughs> All right, now let's do a little bit of dispensationalism here. Verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice. Why should we all be happy? And give honor to him. We got to give honor to God. Why? For the marriage of the Lamb is come. See, the marriage supper. It's starting. It's starting what? It's starting after she burns. That's important to understand. So the marriage supper of the Lamb, when does it begin? It begins after she burns. That's important to understand. Some people think that we're going to be celebrating the marriage supper of the Lamb uh, nonstop. But the thing is this, is that I don't think it's going to be nonstop as soon as we rapture up to heaven. I think the marriage supper of the Lamb, uh, it's going to be continuing onward. 
Now, the thing is this. It says the marriage supper of the, the marriage of the Lamb is come. So it's already here. And his wife hath made herself ready. The wife is preparing herself. She prepared herself. She is ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So she has her garments that are pure and holy. Her own righteousness. Notice it's her own righteousness, not Christ's righteousness. Did you notice that? If you look at verse 7 and 8, when the church is granted her uh, fine linen, her robes, it's the righteousness of saints. It's not based off the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's her own righteousness. Huh. And then verse 9, it says, And he saith unto me, right, so John's writing what God says to him, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. So then there are people who join this marriage supper. Okay, look at Luke 12. And actually, I won't be reading that, but you can look it up because I have to wrap it up here. I want to respect the time, okay? We can look at the verses uh, at next Revelation study, but I'll give you a tease, okay? The idea is this, is that this is where it's going to get deep because I'm not breaking it down. Here we go. You ready? So, if you, in the book of, uh, what I believe is when we get raptured up to heaven, we are going to enjoy heaven before the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Before the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to be enjoying heaven. Why? Because the book, and then after that, we're going to be going through the marriage supper of the Lamb. But what's going to be happening is that uh, these tribulation saints over here, they're going to join us up there. And what's going on is that the marriage is actually ongoing. And then the tribulation saints, they later catch up. Where did you get all of that from? All right, so then in John chap uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it talks about that, and Revelation chapter 2, it talks about that the righteousness is determined by the Christian's reward system. That's dependent on their works. That includes 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. That's why Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8 talks about the righteousness of saints. See that? So why is she made ready at verse 7? It's because she already purified herself through that fire at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 where her works and her righteousness had clothed her and prepared her. And if you compare that with 2 Corinthians chapter 5 as well, we are clothed upon. You looked at Ephesians chapter 5, the bride has to keep cleansing herself, present sanctification without spot or wrinkle. See that? And that's based on what? Sanctification of the word. See, sanctification of the word. So because of that, we can see for a matter of fact that the bride cannot be ready until she goes through the judgment seat of Christ. So hence, judgment seat of Christ has to be before marriage. Why do you say that heaven, we enjoy heaven before the judgment seat of Christ? Because if we insist that the marriage supper of the Lamb and uh, the judgment seat of Christ starts at the beginning, as soon as we get raptured, then uh, we don't have that time to enjoy our mansion in heaven. Because John chapter 14, Jesus says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, rapture, and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So I believe there is a time that they have, they're going to be enjoying their mansion before the judgment seat of Christ. And then it gets to the question of how then the judgment seat of Christ, how will it judge millions of Christians throughout time? The thing is, uh, th is that it's very interesting when you study science and space that time operates differently out there in the universe and lost unbelievers know that compared to here. Yeah. There's a faster and slower process from out there to here. That's what they do. So because heaven's way out there, the Lord can just go like this in time uh, with the judgment seat of Christ. And in our perspective, through rel uh, relativity, see, through relativity of Einstein, over here, in our perspective, it'd be so fast. But over there, time is just normally going on. Over there, time is normally going on. And that's why it makes sense that Second Peter chapter 3, the d a day with the Lord is a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. See that? So it goes all that over there. And then why are these guys going to later catch up? Because Luke chapter 12 says that when Jesus, the bridegroom, when he raptures the tribulation saints, it says he's returning from his wedding. See that? He's so he's already married to someone over there. 
So that proves if he's already married to the church over there before he raptures the tribulation saints, that's utmost proof that the church was already raptured before the tribulation and there's another rapture during the tribulation. All right, now you swallow and chew on that for a while and let's close with a word of prayer. Amen.